This video contains sensitive information and graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. Most individuals, both men and women, have erotic fantasies that range from brief mental images to tales characterized with elaborate plots. The fantasies involve either past or completely imaginative experiences. Rape fantasies have presented the greatest conceptualization challenges for psychologists, researchers, and professionals in all the related fields. This phenomenon is based on the fact that it is almost impossible for someone to actually imagine rape. Critelli and Bavona's study of 2009 places the frequency of rape fantasies as high as 62% among women, with the median frequency being four times a year, and 14% of the participants noting that they had the rape fantasies weekly. These fantasies were found to exist in an erotic aversive spectrum that challenges categories presented in previous research. Critelli and Bavona, in analyzing the prevalence of rape fantasies in their 2008 empirical review, define them based on the legal definitions of rape, which encompasses the use of threats, physical power, and incapacitation to coerce a woman into intercourse against her will. Thus, the fantasies are characterized by sex, non-consent, and force. These contents of rape fantasies are also noted in Critelli and Bivona's study of 2009. The fantasies are abstracted and eroticized in focusing on certain aspects of rape, while eliminating others. The authors present the empirical review on the prevalence of rape fantasies in these tables. As you will notice, the prevalence of rape fantasies ranges from 19 to 57 percent, with the median being 42 percent. The perception of the fantasies as embarrassing and unacceptable is an indication that these numbers could be underestimates. Of particular interest in the rape fantasy studies is Cannon's research of 1982, which uncovered that 21% of the participants note that their fantasies were exciting and terrifying, while 54% were terrifying and contained physically attractive male rapists. According to the research, the fantasies did not contain violence and had a moderate fear because the females fantasized of expressing minimal resistance, but they were overpowered. Cannon explains that aversive fantasies, which were recorded by 29% of the respondents in the study, contained violence and minimal sexual arousal, with women with the fantasies being more apprehensive about the actual act. Thus, the fantasies exist in a continuum between negative and positive. Based on the study, self-identified rape patterns could be more aggressive seductions. These fantasies are presented as coping mechanisms in attempts to making sense of actual rape situations by controlling one's reactions as presented by Golden Clegg. Forceful fantasies in the study were linked to reduced satisfaction in the participants' sex lives, excitement, and explicitness. Gold notes that aversive fantasies are not re-experiences of past trauma that could be recurring. However, women with a history of abuse reported themes of being under someone's control, greater frequency, more explicitness, and having the fantasies at a young age. Bevacquin notes that the widespread awareness of rape as a social problem could have negatively influenced the prevalence of the fantasies, let alone the willingness to report them to researchers. This awareness has informed approaches towards public policy making based on opinions funded by public giant. Bevacquin explains that the rape-related awareness has fluctuated throughout history based on the efforts of the feminist movement. Policy-related responses towards rape were substituted by wife battering and child abuse. Some argue that people fantasize of events of they do not want actually happening in real life, but Critelli and Bavona argue that rape fantasies are particularly different. For instance, Dr. Lister, in an article titled Why Some Women Fantasize About Forceful Sex, and Why That's Nothing to Be Ashamed Of, presents the differences between rape and rape fantasies. The primary argument is the fact that rape is non-consensual with negative consequences, while rape fantasies are a safe place where women exercise control and direction. 
Dr. Lister also maintains that fantasies are strictly fantasies because people think of exposing themselves in public, married people think about cheating, and heterosexual people daydream about being with individuals of the same sex. It is worth noting that we have seen people exposing themselves in public, happily married people in extramarital affairs, heterosexual people becoming bisexual, and some women reporting their fantasies as actual rape. Notably, Critelli and Bavona explain that an extramarital affair sounds dangerous and exciting in the mind and in actuality, but the underlying effects on a marriage assists in avoidance. However, one would avoid rape because of the known consequences, but Cannon explained that while the fantasies of unwanted events are commonly not pleasurable, rape fantasies are sexually arousing and exciting. Maslow attributes the limited study of rape fantasies to beliefs that fantasies, in general, are associated with wishful fulfillment, which implies that some of the women with the fantasies would want to fulfill them. This fulfillment is prevalent in high-dominance women, with those categorized as middle-dominance wishing to be seduced, and those being low-dominance experiencing difficulties in expressing their wishes. However, a significant amount of evidence does not support the masochism theory, which will be discussed later on, since women can control fantasies but the same control is not applicable in instances of rape. Gold and colleagues maintain that women with fantasies do not present greater likelihoods of being actual victims, but are interested in a wide range of sexual activities and sexual stimuli. Critelli and Bavona argue that increased awareness of the prevalence of rape fantasies could be associated with the myth of women wanting to be forced into sex, thereby promoting male sexual aggression. Theories explain various components of rape fantasies, which implies combining various theories provides a better understanding of the phenomenon. Acceptable rape fantasy theories should contain female non-consent, force, and intercourse. One of the most popular explanations for women having rape fantasies is sexual blame avoidance, which involves avoiding accountability or blame for expressing their natural sexuality. This explanation is based on the social construction of women as sexually passive, primarily characterized by not being promiscuous. Hyman and colleagues maintain that rape fantasies solve the dilemma of women being sexual without having to be sexual. Being forced therefore minimizes the guilt of being aggressive and sexual. Algaier and Algaier note that female sexuality is suppressed across various cultures, which increases female guilt in the case of sexual activeness. The authors maintain that men have stronger desires for sex across various cultures. Common slut-shaming labels, such as Trump and Cheap, are used in controlling female sexual behavior. The blame avoidance theory suggests that some women experience negative emotions such as guilt, anxiety, and self-blame in the wake of having sexual fantasies. The imagination of rape therefore eliminates blame since the woman cannot be held accountable for something she was forced into. Critelli and Bavona assert that combining non-consent and force minimizes shame and guilt. Some studies support the blame avoidance theory while others discredit it. For example, the 1974 study by Harriton and Singer uncovered a direct relationship between being brought up in sexually repressive environments and having rape fantasies, as well as increased arousals, orgasms, and marriage contentment for women who had rape fantasies during intercourse. The study also revealed that 65% of the respondents reported moderate to high levels of erotic fantasies during intercourse, with the most common themes including submission and imaginary lover. Harriton's analysis of 1976 divided women with rape fantasies into those who fantasized during intercourse characterized by being conformist, controlled, and dependent, those who had a variety of fantasies during intercourse characterized by having extramarital affairs, and those who did not have any fantasies characterized by experiencing arousal and orgasmic difficulties. Similarly, the 1978 study Moore Alt and Follingstad revealed that fantasy behaviors are part of other sexual behaviors managed by individuals' levels of sex guilt. Participants with high sex guilt noted preference for fantasy themes, indicative of minimal to no responsibility for engaging in intercourse. Participants with erotic fantasies noted high explicitness and variations in the content. The study notes that arousal was affected by response cueing, but not guilt levels. Studies such as Strasberg and Lockhart's in 1998 discredit the validity of the blame avoidance theory by reporting lower sex guilt, more erotophilia, and increased sexual experience for women with rape fantasies. The prevalence of rape fantasies in the study was 55%, with the median frequency being once a month. 
The women also scored higher in consensual fantasies, self-reported sexual experiences, and positive attitudes towards sexual stimuli. Shulman and Horn's study of 2006 revealed that 97% of the sampled college women recorded consensual sex fantasies, while 55% had rape fantasies. Thus, rape fantasies could be triggered by specific situations that were perceived to be wrong. The study found an association between forceful sexual fantasies and sex guilt, which is moderated by erotophilia. Low levels of sex guilt and heightened levels of erotophilia predicted sexual fantasies. The openness to sexual experiences is the direct opposite of the blame avoidance theory through the suggestion that the fantasies are an expression of women who have an open mind when it comes to intercourse. The theory assumes a descriptive approach in examining the implications of empirical trends. For instance, Peltier and Harold's study of 1988 characterized older never married women with vast sexual experiences, including the number of partners and variations in involved sexual activities, with increased frequency of having variations of erotic fantasies, including rape. 97% of the respondents reported experiencing sexual fantasies, with 84% imagining non-consensual situations. Age was related to the frequency and types of fantasies, but not explicitness. The findings of this study are supported by one completed by Gold and colleagues in 1991 where women who fantasized about rape also noted fantasies involving group sex, sex with strangers, and consumed pornographic content. Particularly, 17% of the respondents reported at least a single fantasy of forced sexual activity, and noted being disgusted, guilty, and frightened after the fantasies. Females with sexual fantasies were noted to be interested in a wide range of sexual activities, thereby being more experienced and erotophilic. Crutelli and Bivona's study of 2012 also supported the openness to sexual experiences theory. The study uncovered that women who had higher erotophilia, self-esteem, and consensual fantasies in terms of frequency also reported higher rape fantasies. The women involved in the study fantasized about being forced into intercourse and other related acts by both men and women. The adversary transformation is based on the depiction of rape in romantic novels. Critelli and Bavona maintain that romance novels contain erotic love stories that are appealing to female audiences and account for almost half of the paperback sales in the United States. Thurston's historical review of romance novels uncovered that 54% included the lead female character being raped. Hansen explains that the widespread theme of rape in romance novels significantly informs women's rape fantasies, with the aggressor being handsome and cruel. Gory depicts the men as dangerous, sexually bold, masculine, and strong. A common similarity between the novels and the fantasies is that they are founded on fiction. Most sexual fantasies, both consensual and non-consensual, conform to the social construction of intercourse, with men being active and women being passive. This phenomenon is replicated in romance novels where the female is subject to the male's passion. The other theories covered in the part two of this episode include, desirability, male rape culture, biological predisposition to submission, masochism, and sympathetic physiological activation. Make sure to look out for that one.